So here we have the Maxus eDeliver 3 electric van and this video is uh, basically going to be a beginner's guide or maybe a quick start guide whether you're a new user or you're thinking about buying one of these and I'm going to show you how you use them, how you drive them, charging and all that sort of thing because if you're like most people you're probably not going to read the user manual and I'll put chapters at the bottom of the video so you can jump to the relevant section if you want to. So firstly locking and unlocking, no different to any other vehicle, you've got lock, unlock and then that button does the uh, back doors only. When you come to unlock it, if it's not working then it's either the little coin cell battery in your key fob here that has gone flat or it's your 12 volt battery up front which has gone flat and there's another video on the channel to show you how you solve those issues uh, but if that's the case you've still got a, a physical key blade here when all things are flat that you can unlock it and open the bonnet. So to start your van you put the key in the ignition you must put your foot on the brake and then turn it two clicks so all the lights come on on the dash and then turn it round and release to that sort of starter motor position if it was an ice vehicle and you'll get the bing and the ready light there on the dash and that ready light means you're ready to go but obviously it is completely silent because it's electric there's no uh, noise or vibration because there's no combustion engine up front so this is your gear selector drive neutral and reverse and you drive this like an automatic however you must keep your foot on the foot brake whenever you're changing this there may be times where you're doing low speed maneuvers let's say you're parking for example where you're going from drive to reverse fairly quickly even though you think you've pushed the brakes it might be slightly out of sync when you're at, when you're actually moving this switch so um, there will be times where you think it's in reverse the cameras come on the beepers have come on but when you take your foot off the brake and go to accelerator, there's no drive, you're not going backwards. And that's just because you, you touching the brakes with your foot hasn't been in sync with the moving of this. And what you've got to do is just move your foot across, jab the brakes, and then you'll find the reverse is engaged and you will move. And the same goes for selecting drive as well. There might be times where you haven't done it in sync and you've just got to jab the brake again just to enable it to engage and then you're off. Unlike an automatic though, there isn't a park position and park is basically put it in neutral and make sure the handbrake's It'll on. It will start to easy in an electric vehicle as well, even if you're on a very steep ramp like a, um, a multi-storey car park, for example. So when you're holding it in drive on the brake, you can release the brake, go across the accelerator, it will not roll back and then you can accelerate and gently pull away. So much easier than messing around with the clutch. Knees at low speed, I think below about 17 miles an hour. It does emit a noise out the front. It's got a speaker behind the front bumper and it does produce a tone. It's a pedestrian warning system and the pitch of that changes with the speed. And then as soon as you get over that sort of 16, 17 miles an hour, that turns off because by then the tires are making enough noise and it's not needed. So next to drive mode, you have an eco switch here. And when you push that, it says eco at the top right of the screen there and that basically reduces the power to the motor but I would recommend all you new drivers drive in eco mode it's a far more comfortable driving mode it basically reduces the power of the motor up front and um, that on these vans makes it a much smoother ride if you're not used to an electric vehicle you can tend to find the accelerator pedals are very light and because with electric motor you get all the torque from zero they tend to go like a rocket particularly if you're used to driving a diesel van before these are really lively and eco mode just smooths that power a little bit more and just makes it a lot more comfortable to drive while you're driving at any point you can press this on and off to take it in and out of eco mode but I think for the, uh, the first time driver of these vans, it's a much more comfortable drive to have it in eco. Eco mode also caps the van's top speed as well. So if you're driving on a motorway or dual carriageway, or you want to overtake, for example, you want full power, then you're gonna to want to take it out of eco mode as well. But you have to remember, eco mode is all about preserving energy, driving more efficiently. So when you're driving in full power mode, you obviously are gonna use more energy. If you're a new driver 
to an electric vehicle, uh, particularly with electric vans, they're going to feel slower than they actually are. EVs aren't slow at all, far from it. You obviously have all the talk from zero with electric motor. They accelerate much, much quicker, much quicker than a diesel van would. But you don't feel it because with a diesel van, you get all this noise and vibration when you're accelerating and when you're driving fast. But with an electric vehicle, you don't have any of that. They're quiet, they're smooth. You've got very smooth linear acceleration. And because of that, you don't have the same sort of feedback. So as a new EV driver, the electric van will feel slower than you're actually doing and you have to watch your speed. It is quite easy to think you're doing 10, 15 or even 20 miles slower than you're actually doing just because these are so quiet and smooth. Bottom below is regenerative braking, reg. And when you push that, you scroll through three levels of regenerative braking mode. And up here on the screen, it will show you your level and you go from medium to high to low and it will toggle between all those three modes and again you can push this while you're driving you can change that on the fly and that gives you those three regenerative braking effects so let me explain what that is so basically with an electric vehicle you have this regenerative braking effect but it's got nothing to do with your braking it's basically uh, engine braking, the equivalent of engine braking in a nice vehicle. So with an electric motor, when you put the accelerator down, you're obviously turning the electric motor, which is turning your wheels. But when you lift off the accelerator, that electric motor is still spinning because it's attached to your wheels and you've got the kinetic energy um, of the vehicle going forward. And that's then turning the electric motor. So that motor effectively then turns into a dynamo and it starts putting electricity back into your battery pack. And then obviously that is charging your battery and extending your range. So while the vehicle is slowing down, you're slowing down on the electric motor, which is charging the battery. So you want to capitalize on that. So you want to do all your slowing down using the motor rather than using the brakes because when you're pressing the brakes you're wasting that kinetic energy into friction and heat on the brake pads and wearing out your brakes whereas you want to capture it and put it back into your battery pack and you can adjust that braking effect on the motor with your regenerative braking switch so low is very little uh, engine braking effectively and that's about the same level as your previous combustion engine vehicle. What I would suggest as a new driver, you probably would want to start off putting it in medium and that gives you that increased level of braking. So when you lift off the accelerator, the vehicle will then slow down and it's a very nice feeling and it makes the vehicle feel very safe and secure because it's always slowing down when you lift off the accelerator. But when you're used to it, I would suggest high is the nicest mode and uh, electric vehicle drivers, once you're used to your electric vehicle, really favour strong regenerative braking. And what that is, is when you lift off the accelerator, it stops very quickly and it gives you very strong regen braking. Um, and it's a nice feeling because it's then what's called one pedal driving. So the reality is you never go across or hardly ever go across to the brake pedal. You can feather your um, accelerator pedal to do all your changes in speed. So if you're coming up to a corner, you would just lift off the accelerator pedal slightly to slow you down. And obviously as you go around the corner, you can then start putting it back on. And when you've got it in high, there's a lot of times when you're driving, you won't take your foot off the accelerator pedal at all. You will just feather it up and down to change your speed. And that's where it come, That's where it's called one pedal driving. And you will only use the brakes to hold you when you stop that last little bit as you're coming up to, so let's say a junction, traffic lights or whatever, you would use the brakes to hold the vehicle or obviously in an emergency. But apart from that, all you're driving will just be feathering that accelerator pedal. When you're slowing down on the electric motor, the kinetic energy of the vehicle going forward is then captured, turned into electricity, and put back into that battery pack underneath, which extends your range. It also means you're not wearing down your brake pads and your brake discs. You're then also not getting brake dust on your wheels, and your wheels are very much cleaner. 
and if you drive these vans properly with with the highest level of regen and you hardly use the brakes then your brake pads and your brake disc are going to last 100 150 maybe even 200,000 miles so it's better for your wallet and it's also better for the environment because all that brake particle matter ends up getting into the air and the waterways so next I'll talk about this gauge which is your power meter and it's a very important gauge to use if you want to drive economically and maximize your range because this effectively is like a rev counter in a combustion engine vehicle it's going to show you the power you're using and then also the power you're putting back into the battery pack when you're slowing down on the electric motor that is your regenerative braking so when you pull away and you use electricity anything above the naught is the power you're consuming and it's in um, white bars so if i just move you'll see there's one bar there so the more bars you use the more power you're using so you want to try to drive keeping it within one bar obviously there'll be times where you're accelerating and it will go to two bars or if you're driving up hills you will use more power but what you want to do just if you want to drive economically of course is just to minimize the power use so try to keep it in one bar which just means accelerating a little bit more gently and also when you get to your speed maybe just lifting off the accelerator just a tad your tops your cruising speed isn't going to change but you might notice it will drop a bar and then when it drops below naught the bars light up green and this is showing the energy you're putting back into the battery pack so when you're slowing down using your regenerative braking the motor is putting that energy back into the battery most of the time you'll only see one but there will be times where you'll see two or three particularly if you're coming down a hill but the longer you can be regenerative braking and putting power back into the battery the better your range is going to be so that will either be by strong regenerative braking using high mode and it will give it little bursts or by having maybe less regen or by lifting the accelerator sooner and coasting and all the time you're coasting you're putting energy back into the battery and that's what you want to capitalize on to get better range and better driving efficiency so what that means is you read the road ahead a little bit more and lift off the accelerator and coast and all the time you're coasting you're charging the battery if you find you're going for the brakes then you're wasted that kinetic energy on braking and you could have put it into the battery so you're either not driving with the right regen mode or you're just driving too fast and not reading the road ahead you shouldn't really need to be using the brakes in these and uh, it's actually a much more comfortable way of driving and the main thing is you're going to see a better range so let's show you what else is on this instrument cluster obviously you've got your speedo in the middle no different to any other car on this side you've got your fuel gauge which obviously is not a fuel tank it's a battery pack but it works just the same as a combustion engine vehicle um, on these when it's at full it is isn't actually full full would be another sort of two blocks beyond again exactly the same as most combustion engine vehicles when you see the first bar drop i think it's at something like 80 percent uh, state of charge but anyway i'll show you that on this other screen in a minute but as you can see when you're down at the bottom the last bar is red because when you're down to let's say sort of um, 20 percent or so you would want to then consider uh, charging if you're still out on a drive but obviously if you're going back to base um, and it's within the range then uh, yeah you would just be charging overnight typically but anyway I'll talk more about charging later on so here is a screen that you can change the information that's displayed on the home screen here you've got your trip computer and then the mileage of the van and you use this button here to change the information that's on the screen here we have the estimated range and I would highly recommend you do not keep it on this screen most drivers will and the result of that is they get completely obsessed with the estimated range these are very inaccurate and can be quite badly uh, inaccurate and um, it just gives people range anxiety it is far better to have it on the battery state of charge which i'll show you in a second next we've got uh, meet um, the drive motor revolutions completely pointless 
Next we've got the traction battery voltage. Again, that's completely pointless to most drivers. Then we've got the traction battery current. Again, completely useless. You will never need that. Here we have the speed. It's just a digital speedometer instead of the analog one there. Then we've got the driving economy. So with a combustion engine vehicle, you measure the economy of your driving in miles per gallon in the UK. Here we've got kilowatt hours per 100 miles, which isn't a particularly common unit. Typically we would use miles per kilowatt hour. But anyway, this is the electric equivalent of your driving economy. Then we've got your average driving uh, economy. And then there, here we have the SOC, state of charge. And this is the screen that I recommend you leave your vehicle on. It is the most useful screen. It's basically showing you this, but in a much more accurate figure. And displaying your state of charge will not give you range anxiety as much as displaying your estimated range. Firstly, it's completely accurate whereas the estimated range isn't. Let's give you an example. This van is a 35 kilowatt hour van and these do anything from 100 to 150 miles. If it was the 50 or the 52 kilowatt hour van, it will do anything from 150 to 200 miles. But on these, when it's fully charged, the estimated range always says 98 miles, which is like the worst case scenario. And on the higher battery, the bigger battery model, I think it says 148 or 150 miles. Again, worst case scenario. And what you find is when you're driving, you end up doing about one and a half miles for every mile on the estimated range and it slowly compensates. But because of that, all the time it's inaccurate. Um, and as I said, it gives you range anxiety if you're not used to it. It's far better to see state of charge. So when you get in, it will probably say 100% because you've charged overnight. And then slowly that will drop down. And you, you get a feel of what the range is and how you're going, how you're quickly you're using it. And you treat it just like your previous combustion engine vehicle. When it starts getting low, if you need to, you charge, but most likely um, you won't be because you'll be driving back to base where you'll be charging at base. But I really can't stress enough how you should be displaying that and not the estimated range. I know it'll be very difficult as a new user, but you mustn't put too much emphasis on that because that's always a calculation based on driving, temperature outside, whether you're using the heating, and it can be wildly inaccurate. And then finally, the last screen is tyre pressures, and I've got a video on the channel on that if you want to know more about how this works, but it basically tells you the pressure in every tyre and then tells you if you've got a puncture in one of those. So next I'll just go through the controls, but it's all standard, same sort of stuff that you would see in a nice vehicle, so nothing special. This side you've got your lights, and this does have automatic lights, so generally you're going to leave it on auto. Um, and obviously this is your indicator stalk as well. On this side, you've got wipers, it's all standard. Um, this is your cruise control uh, buttons. And then here we've got um, your telephone answering, mute and volume for your radio or audio. And the volume is up and down like that. This way is changing the source music. Um, you've got your touchscreen here which is, uh, this one is the generation one, the newer ones have a different interface, um, but you've got FM radio. You do have DAB on these as well, but it's done under MP3. Again, I'm not gonna go into all of this because I've done a separate video to how you use this, which I'll put in a, a link at the top of the screen and also in the, in the um, video comments below, in the video description below. Um, here, this button here is a home button which is actually the same as that button there. And under vehicle settings, there's a few things you can tweak with your vehicle on that screen. These two slots here are for holding credit cards or charge cards. You can fit two or three in each, and it's just a slot in the dash just for storing cards. Here we have a 12 volt um, accessory socket. Here is a blank plate, even though it's got a USB symbol next to it, that is just a blank plate, so don't try pulling that out. The USB socket is actually down here under that rubber flap. And then the final thing, up here on the roof, you've got an SOS button. 
and you use this if you're uh, involved in an accident and you need emergency assistance. So this is your heater controls and your heater and air conditioning uses the traction battery underneath. So using either air conditioning or heating will consume more energy and effectively reduce your range. So you want to keep that to a minimum. Just using the fan and blowing fresh air through is using a 12 volt battery. So the power consumption is absolutely minimal. But when you've got heating switched on or air conditioning switched on, you are going to assume, consume more energy. This heating system is a little bit different to other vehicles. And again, I've done a separate video on how you use this, which I'll link at the top of the screen and also put in the video description below. Um, so watch that for more detail, but I'll just show you the basics because it is a little bit different. So you can switch on the fan with the fan switch, no different to anything else. And you can adjust where the air flows through with these buttons here again and that button there again no different what is different with this vehicle is the heating and air conditioning is just an on, on or off there's no variable uh, in controls as such so the air conditioning is either on or off just like it is actually in a lot of other vehicles so that isn't any different what is different is the heating works the same way that is heating so again heating is either on or off it's a bit different because you can't change the temperature. You either have the heat on or the heat off. But air conditioning is the same as that in many vehicles anyway. So effectively they've copied the same thing. But what it does is it promotes um, minimal use, which is a good thing on a small battery electric vehicle. So when you want heat, you have it on. And when it gets too hot, you turn it off. So you don't end up leaving it on all the time. But it takes a bit of getting used to. The other thing is the heater is very hot. So you'll get heat within there, three seconds, and it gets very hot. For most of the time, it's gonna to be too hot. So what they've provided is an eco button, which is there, and that minimizes it. It gives you half the heat. So that's your two settings, full heat or half heat. And the same is on the air conditioning. You've got full air conditioning, or you press eco, and you've got half air conditioning. And for most of the time, you're going to want eco on because the air conditioning can often be too cold and the heating is certainly always too cold. The other thing I'll just point out, the air conditioning has come on now and that compressor is quite noisy initially and you can feel the vibrations through the floor. That is completely normal, but it does quieten down. There we go. I don't know whether the microphone is picking it up, but it's just turned off then. But that air conditioning compressor will kick in and out as you're driving. And when it kicks on, it does vibrate and you can hear it, but it's completely normal. But when, it, when it's been on a few minutes and it's sort of warmed up, the, the it is a lot quieter and a lot smoother. It's just that initial time when the air conditioning system kicks in, it is a little bit noisy. These vans also have heated seats and the switches for them are down there. And then there's a light at the top to tell you when they're on. They are sort of out of view and out of mind, but heated seats are just great. And they're particularly good in electric vehicles because it's a lot more efficient to heat your seats, so you heat your bum and your back, than heating all the air in the cabin. Because the heated seats are only using the 12 volt battery up front, Whereas to heat the air, you're using the traction battery. So try to use the heated seats as much as you can. In the spring and uh, autumn, when it starts getting chilly, the heated seat should be your first port of call for any warmth rather than the heater. And then in the winter, you'll use the heater initially to melt the ice off the windows and get the cabin warm. But then again, you could probably turn this off and just keep warm with the heated seats. It's a much more efficient way of warming yourself in these vans. So around the back of the van, if the van is locked, you can push that button there and that will just unlock the back doors only, but it won't unlock the side door. Obviously, if you press that button there, everything is unlocked. These vans do have parking sensors as well, and they do also have the reversing camera here. So while you're at the back of the van, it's a good idea just to wipe your thumb over that, just to keep that lens clean. So these vans do have 180 degree opening rear doors, which allows you to load the van with a forklift, but they do not have any check straps here. So what can happen is the wind can catch the doors and blow, uh, blow the doors open to their full extent past that sort of stop point there. So what a lot of owners have done is made their own check straps 
just by um, screwing a latch here or, or a, um, a fabric strap or whatever but you're, I'm sure you'll see on the Facebook group and things the various ways people have achieved that. So next I'm going to talk about the charge cables usually these are stored underneath the passenger seat so these fans come with two charge cables this is your type 2 to type 2 AC charging cable and you will use this to plug into your home or workplace wall charger if you have one stalled, installed and you should do um, but you also want to keep this in the van because you will use this to plug into a public type 2 charging point that is for AC charging only slow charging but you often find those in supermarkets and car parks and things like that places where the vehicles parked for a while so you always want to keep this with the vehicle so you can utilize a public AC charging post when you're out and about and here is the portable charger these are often called a granny cable and again we've got a type 2 connector here to go in the front of the van but at the other end we have got a three pin plug so this allows you to charge the vehicle from any normal main socket they are slow because they're limited to 10 amp because you can't put any more than 10 amp through a UK plug and socket for hours on on time otherwise they start getting too warm and charging at 10 amp you will add about nine miles of range for every hour of charging whereas if you get a proper seven kilowatt wall charger installed when you would use this cable this charges then at 32 amps you will add 25 miles of range or so per hour versus your nine miles but these are very handy to use when you're on site so um, if you've driven to a site you can top up throughout the day on a three pin plug and probably bring your van back up to 100% um, so again keep this with the vehicle because obviously you can then charge the van wherever you are because obviously we have electricity in every building they're also a good emergency backup because while you're only going to get nine miles an hour again you can plug in anywhere with that and you don't need any other cables whenever you're rapid charging so that's the DC charging uh, with a public rapid charger you don't need a cable because the cable is always on the connector because of the power that's going through it ends up being about one and a half inches thick so you only need a cable when you're AC charging you don't need a cable when you're DC charging and your charge ports are at the front of the van here behind this flap and this is locked so if the van is locked the charge flap is locked so if the van is locked you need to push the unlock button there on your remote and to open this you've got to push in the middle of the emblem so what I'd rec recommend is you use the palm of your hand and you push on this area there so you just give that a little push and then that releases it and you can open it like that and when you're shutting it you do the same push it down push in the middle of the emblem and put your weight behind it and it shuts like that so you will have to crouch down but when you're used to where they are you can do it from above without looking but anyway here is your type 2 charging port they're protected with these rubber bungs which stops the moisture getting in them so this is called a type 2 and all your AC charging is done through this port with one of those two cables in the back so typically this will be charging at home or at base overnight and then this is your CCS connector so this is the DC rapid charging so when you're on a drive and you need to extend the range at the roadside this is when you would use a CCS connector which is actually connects in the whole lot and this is where you would get that rapid charge in a typically motorway services or petrol station or a place like that so here I've got a portable charger which is very similar to the portable charger that is in the back of the van and what you want to do when you're charging whether it's a portable charger or you're using a proper wall charger you always plug the other end in first and make it live so even though the charging unit in the cable is powered there is no electricity at the charging socket that you put into the vehicle until it is properly plugged into the vehicle and the same goes with a, a wall charger as well so they've obviously thought about all of this it's 100% safe so you could even drop this into a puddle as you're walking up to your van and it will not electrocute yourself there is no power on these middle pins until it is plugged into the vehicle 
and it has done all its safety checks and it's safe to charge and then the contactors click over and then provide the power. But that's why it's best to have it live before you plug it into the vehicle so the communications can start straight away. So we come up to the vehicle, we open the charge port, we remove the top bung because we're only AC charging here and we get the connector and push it firmly into the charge port. The vehicle will then communicate with the charger and when it's happy and safe to start charging, which takes about five seconds, you can now see the light is flashing there to show the vehicle is now charging. And while it's charging, the vehicle is also then locked to this cable into the charge port so no one can remove it and stop your charge or steal your cable. So when you finish charging and you want to remove your cable, because this is locked in the vehicle, you simply push the unlock button there on your key. You can hear the little slider locking pin release and then you can remove your cable. And the same goes also if you're using the CCS connector when you're rapid charging. So when you're finished, you simply put your rubber bungs back and shut the charge port. So next, gonna have a look under the bonnet. So you release the bonnet catch with a catch there. And the bonnet is pinged up here so you can find the catch in the middle and you push up and that releases it. But these bonnets are a bit different to other vehicles in that they're not hinged here, you have to lift the whole bonnet off. So what you do is you hold the catch to this side, get your hands on the other side of the bonnet and just pull forward a little bit and then lift the whole thing off. When you're putting your bonnet down, you want to just lay it flat gently on the ground and it will sit on the latch in the middle and then the two hooks on either end. And then underneath this bonnet, the only things you're gonna access is probably filling up your screen washer bottle here Maybe in the future changing a light bulb in your headlights and maybe one day changing your 12 volt battery or charging it if it's gone flat. There is a video on the YouTube channel, again I'll link up there and put in the video description below on how you do that and what alternative batteries you can buy for these vans. And if you want to know more about all what's under the bonnet here, again, I've done a video on the channel about that. A link is in the top of the screen there and also in the video description below. So when you're putting the bonnet back on, just get it roughly right. Just put it where you think it's gonna be and then you can give it a little wiggle to get those hooks in the far corners aligned and they will sort of fall in the right place. The center bonnet catch will then latch and just push it down there. So I think I've covered all the basics, but if you want to know more about these vans, I'll put a link to a playlist in the video description below where you can watch further videos I've made on these vans. If you found this useful, then please do click the thumbs up button on YouTube. That really does help other people find the channel. Uh, do subscribe if you want to know more about electric vehicles, and I'll see you on the next video.